a miracle. It is a miracle in a very tight spot. It is a miracle that has completely lost the confidence of most of the international community, but it has no good options on the board. It is a country that has perhaps not played the chess game exactly the way that it should have, but it wouldn't have made a difference even if it had. It is a country that the world now regrets that it created. There's no question about that. This vote is about undoing, essentially, the vote of November 29, 1947. But that doesn't matter. They really can't undo that vote, because we're there, and we're there to stay. And we're there to stay because we understand that fundamentally, the country is a miracle. So I ask you to think about the following in the days that are ahead. In the days that you recommit yourself to the support of Stand With Us, and even more importantly, in the days in which you recommit yourself to the support of the Jewish state, and therefore the, the future of the Jewish people. I ask you to remember that even in the darkest days, someone who had real perspective could grab the arm of someone like me, who allowed himself the luxury, foolishly and stupidly, of thinking that he was living through a hard time, who actually had no idea what a hard time was, who said to me in that choked up voice of his with his eyes brimming with tears, this country is a miracle. The challenge that you and I have is to keep the miracle going. The challenge that you and I have is to not give up. The challenge that you and I have is to lace up our boots and roll up our sleeves and get to work and do whatever needs to be done so that someday we hopefully may even live to see the fruition of the prayer we so commonly say. Hashem oz la'amo yitain, Hashem yivarek et amo shalom. God will first grant God's people strength, and then, one day we hope, God will give our people peace. Shana Tovah. Some of the materials that Stand With Us has put out, for example, the little bit about the West Bank and statistics about the West Bank, that is exactly the kind of stuff that people need to hear. I think, by the way, the most important thing to do in the media at this point, and you're writing letters to the editor, does matter. They may not print a letter of every single person in this room, but they will print some of them, and some of them need to get out there. And they also, by the way, even the ones that they don't print, they understand that it reflects the views of their leadership. So it's very important to write in. Uh, but here's what I think. Uh, you know, part of the point needs to be, it's too easy for the media to say, anybody who's against the UN vote is against the creation of a Palestinian state forever and forever and forever. And I think that part of the genius of what you say here, what you see here, for example, say yes to peace. And then other things, you know, the pro-peace, the pro pro-Israel camp. There, it does, which should be, I think, by the way, as a pro-Israel camp, a very, very big tent. We dare not think that all of us in the pro-Israel camp have to agree with each other. We can have very different views, and that's perfectly legitimate, it's probably healthy. There are a lot of people in the pro-Israel camp who believe that you actually need to have a Palestinian state eventually, when it's not an existential threat to Israel, because even if we have to send our children off to war, and have sent our children off to war, we don't want our children to send their children off to war. And the only way to make sure that that happens is to get this thing resolved and have them eventually get to a place where they're having a state that's not an existential threat to us. 
I think the media assumes that most people who are opposed to this vote are opposed to a Palestinian state forever and forever and ever. And if you can shake them up and say to them, for example, I actually want the Palestinians to have a state. Among other reasons, first of all, they leave us alone. Secondly, just like American Jews have made Aliyah to Israel because they want to live among their own people and their own heritage and their own culture, some Arabs who live in Israel might move from Israel to Palestine, which would also help Israel's demographic issue. And there's a whole array of reasons why I think Jews could want there to be a successful Palestinian state. We have to mix it up. We have to show them that they're much more complicated, much more nuanced, much more complex uh, than they imagine. So writing to the press and speaking to the press is very important. <coughs> but again, you, don't have, you should not expect immediate results. It's a matter of planting seeds and eventually stories get picked up. Um, and uh, I know that Ross mentioned just a couple nights ago that CNN called her for the first time this week ever. In other words, they reported about Stand With Us's work prior, but this was the first time that they actually called her for a quote about a story that they were doing about, about billboards and so forth. Um, so you can make progress. It's slow and it's painstaking. But Congress people, by the way, don't read every single letter that they get, but their staff do count them all on which issues they come in and where they stand. And the same thing is true of the press. So reaching out to the press is very important. The, yeah. the Israeli economy and housing is probably doing much better than here. Is that a, a facade? Is that a bubble? Are those people Israeli living in that oblivious to everything around them? Or is that part of the very... The Israeli economy? Yeah. No, the Israeli economy is actually doing pretty well. I mean, obviously the Israeli economy is uh, partly an egalitarian economy, as you saw in the social protests. There is concern on the part of a lot of people that you know housing is in tight supply, and certainly housing in these places people really, really, really want to live is in very tight supply and is very expensive. There was the whole cottage cheese uh, thing that happened earlier this summer. This food has gotten very expensive. No, but fundamentally, um, Bibi Netanyahu, whatever people think about him now, and people can be divided, I think it's almost impossible to deny that he was an unbelievably prescient and successful minister of the treasury. And the privatization that he, took, that he undertook to do during his time uh, in that office proved to be unbelievably, uh, unbelievably uh, healthy for Israel. The banking industry in Israel is very different. The whole mortgage system is very different. It's a much more conservative banking industry. So no, it's not a bubble. I mean, it's not egalitarian. And there are many issues. There's a huge issue of poverty. I think something like 20% of Israeli children live under the poverty line. So I mean, there's a lot of things that are wrong. Um, a lot of that, by the way, is Haredi and Arabs, which is two separate issues. Um, but nonetheless, it's a very serious problem. But fundamentally, the Israeli economy is actually a very robust economy. Israel um, has numbers that America would be very happy to have in unemployment and growth rate and so on and so forth. Hi. Um, thank you for speaking. But I just wanted to ask this. I kind of felt like I disagreed with one of your statements about the saddest thing being the silence of the world. Um, I personally feel like the saddest thing going on right now is the silence or the the obliviousness of the Jewish people to what's going on, especially on campuses. And I was just going to ask like, how do you feel and what do you think our response as pro Israel advocates on campus should be to outside Jewish organizations that either don't do anything to help or are openly against helping us, or being on campus and saying that we will not be openly pro Israel? And just how do you think we should deal with that? Okay. Uh, so first of all, I accept the uh, correction. I don't think we have to have a competition of which is the saddest thing. Uh, <laughs> like a fourth grade, how would you rather die? Be sat on my elephant or eat my lion? I mean, I don't know. Neither of them sound like <laughs> uh, There are a lot of sad things in the world. Mine can be sad, yours can be sad. Baruch Hashem has a lot of sadness to go around. So uh, you know, if you have a lot of some of my sadness, I'm happy to get rid of it. I, 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 I grant your point. I don't know what's the saddest thing in the world. Um, the more serious question, though, is you know how do you handle these? How do you handle this young American swath? It's, it's not only young, by the way. It gets far beyond the university age level, but um, it's certainly pronounced in universities who are either apathetic or, frankly, negatively predisposed to being involved in this issue. Well, before you can know how to respond, you know the obvious response is simply to find them and beat them to a pulp. But I mean, um, <laughs> that's a joke. Okay. Uh, before, before you can really know how to respond, the first thing that you have to ask yourself is how do we get it? Why do they feel the way they feel? Whereas before you can respond, you have to understand the phenomenon. The phenomenon, it seems to me, stems from a number of different factors, and we can't go into all of it tonight. But the phenomenon stems, first of all, from an unbelievable ignorance. But I mean, an astounding ignorance. So that, for example, um, people know that they're opposed to the occupation, 
Okay? See that? Ask them how it got started, they actually have no idea. Now, you and I think it's so obvious, but, but they just have no idea. They're opposed to the separation barrier, the, the security fence, the apartheid wall. Call it what you want to call it. Don't call it the apartheid wall. Um, they're opposed to it. Yeah, it's ugly. Do they know anything about the fact that as the kilometers of the security barrier increased, the number of suicide bombings went down, and that the Palestinians themselves were on record as saying, this is actually making the Antifada very complicated? I mean, do they know about that? They have actually no clue. Tell them I'm at home. Um, <laughs> Sell, it's your broker. Um, in any event, I, uh, so I think the first thing that has to be countered is, um, is, is just plain ignorance. And there, by the way, the stuff that Stan with us produces is, I think, really, really, really good and really, really helpful. There's just a tremendous amount of lack of knowledge there, and that's the first thing. The second thing is this. This is a much longer conversation, which we can only touch on briefly now. But there is on this generation of Americans, and it actually goes up a generation or two as well, a profound discomfort with particularism. There was a profound discomfort with saying, I am committed to the thriving of my people. Like, I like all people all over the world. I think everybody should be happy and not sad. And I think everybody should be fed. And I think everybody should be housed. I do think that. But, you know, the very famous phrase, Im ein ani li mi li, if I'm not for myself, who's going to be for, for me? And if I'm only for myself, what am I? I think American Jews, of all different generations, by the way, it's not only college kids have done a very good job of saying to themselves, if I'm only for myself, who am I? And they've done a very poor job of saying, if I'm not for myself, who will be for me? And this is a perfect example of that week. Who's out there for us? Nobody. But we have actually raised a generation of American Jews who are so profoundly universalist in their fundamentalist orientation that they... And when you couple that with their ignorance, they simply don't know how to defend the idea of a Jewish state. Oh my God, a Jewish state. America is not a Protestant state. It's not a Catholic state. It's not a Jewish state. They don't understand that Israel is not America. Israel is not a Hebrew-speaking United States. America and Israel are two very, very different enterprises. They're both wonderful enterprises. They're both deeply flawed enterprises. But they are different enterprises. If in 100 years from now, America is mostly Hispanic, and therefore Congress is mostly Hispanic. And America elects a Hispanic president who's committed to all the great values of American life. Is that a success or a failure of American democracy? I would claim that it's a complete success of American democracy. It's a wonderful thing. And a hundred years from now, if Israel is mostly Arab, and the Knesset is mostly Arab, and Israel elects its first Arab prime minister, is that a failure or a success of Israeli democracy? That's much more complicated. That's a success of the democracy. But it's not why we created the state. The state was created for the purpose of the revitalization and the flourishing of the Jewish people. The flag says that. The anthem says that. The Declaration of Independence says that. Many of its policies say that. The law of return says that. It's not an egalitarian society. It has to give all of its citizens equal rights. That's for sure. But it's not meant to be a Hebrew-speaking America. And because, by the way, we keep speaking of Israel as if it were a Hebrew-speaking America, they look at things that Israel does, and then Israel doesn't measure up. So we've got to really break people out of this inability to speak in the particular. Really, the anthem of this generation, and its parents, by the way, because its parents were the ones who adopted the anthem, the anthem was written by John Lennon, right? And it says, imagine a world with no countries, it isn't hard to do, nothing to kill or die for, and no religion to. Now, it's a great song. And when you're with your girlfriend or your boyfriend at Central Park, and you got the little friendship circles going and the candles, or the last night of camp, and everybody's sobbing, and oh my God, I'm going to miss you, and I'm going to face with you, and blah, 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 which means I'm going to forget you tomorrow. Okay? But I know that, you know, so imagine John Lennon, it's, you know, it's like a transcendent spiritual experience. That's beautiful. Have a great time. But the words are ridiculous. They are completely ridiculous. Imagine a world without countries, nothing to kill or die for, and no religion to. That's what countries and religions are about, killing and dying. That's absurd. It is a complete myopic misread of what happened during the Second World War, and Americans, more than anybody else, bought into that garbage, hook, line, and sinker. And more than Americans bought into it, American Jews bought into it. And therefore, what's happened now is American Jews' fundamental liberalism, 
but a kind of open-minded liberalism which leaves no place for the particular. There's nothing wrong with being a liberal. But liberals used to be able to also say that they cared about the particular from which they came. And that ability has been completely wrong. Now, we can say much more about this, but I want to get to the question of how do you respond to it. First, you respond with information. Second, you respond with an awareness that you are not going to turn all these people around. The damage is done. We have lost a tremendous swath of this generation of young American Jews. You're not going to get them back. They're gone. History. Bad education yields bad results, and a lot of those results are permanent. I hate to say it, but it's true. But you can turn some of them around. You can turn some of them around by having them begin to understand why the Jews created a state. The Jews created a state because they understood that they were this peculiar people in the world that was wanted by no one. They were thrown out by England, they were thrown out by Spain, they were thrown out by Germany, and they were thrown out by all the Arab countries. They were thrown out of all of these countries in which they were probably the most contributing subsection of society. There is something about the world which will not make a space for us. And you're saying to yourself, what about America? Yes, America made this space for us the way it does now, precisely once there was in Israel. It was not like this in the 1930s in America. And it was not like this in the 1940s in America. And it wasn't like this in the 1950s in America. In the 1950s and the early 1960s, you did not walk into a Wall Street firm or a Madison Avenue firm with your resume in hand, wearing a kippah, and say, I want a job and I leave early on Fridays. They would say, you can leave early now. <laughs> what changed was 1967. 1967 enabled American Jews to carry themselves differently. 1967 got Soviet Jews to start rattling the cage. 1967, where Jews finally said to the world in a, an abashedly obvious way, we take responsibility for our own destiny, that was when Jews began to feel differently about themselves in South Africa, in Israel, in Europe, in America, almost everywhere you can turn. And I think that because we're talking about college students, the arguments have to be intellectually sophisticated. We have got to get out of this business. Oh, join the Jewish people. They're always trying to kill us. That's not a Madison Avenue campaign. <laughs> no, seriously, guys, that's what we say. They're always trying to kill us. Don't give Hitler a posthumous victory. Just come and be a victim with me. That's insane. And you can't say that you, you, know, you can't deny Israel's imperfections. You have to be intellectually serious. So Akiva was nice enough to mention it before, so therefore I don't feel totally slimy about saying it now. That's exactly what I tried to do in that book, Saving Israel. What I tried to do was make an argument for what Israel does, not with Arabs, not with Islam, why Israel changes the existential Jewish condition of Jews everywhere on the planet. And it can be my book, there's a lot of other books that are out there that are much better, but their problem is that their authors don't say that about my book. But what are you going to do? <laughs> but the problem is that there is a lot, I think, the way to engage this generation is through serious discussions about the place of particularism, why heritage matters, why tradition matters, why people want to preserve their languages. There's a lot to be said about this. But I think that the fundamental engagement has to be A, long haul, be prepared for lots of disappointment, provide information, and fundamentally, uh, it's also very important to give people an intellectually, people who are Cal, for example, are smart. And they deserve to hear arguments that every bit as sophisticated as what they're hearing in a college classroom. I want to make one last point about this. Hyperbole about Israel in the positive or Arabs in the negative is a very destructive tool in this. You know, you say something about Arabs that's exaggerated. Or say stuff like, you know, there is a state for Palestinians. It's in Jordan. Now, I don't care if you believe that. Just don't say it. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm dead serious. Because it's unbelievably destructive. They think, in a realistic world, Jordan is not going to be the Palestinian state. And they're right. Jordan is not going to be the Palestinian state, but something really hard to imagine happens in Jordan. Because even if, even if, if, if Abdullah falls, it's a long way from there to all these Palestinians in the West Bank wanting to go to Jordan. In other words, you have to be realistic about the world. And whatever radical ideas or radical thoughts or theological prayers we may have, that's not the place to bring them up. People on college campuses are cerebral, rational, smart, inquisitive, and that's the way I think to begin to do that. Maybe one last question and then we'll call it an evening. Yes, sir, in the green shirt. Thank you. Um, the Lycée Francais was created because the French cared about their culture throughout the world. What's the role of Israel moving forward now in terms of education, Jewish education, where 
you see a positive you see a positive synergy between Israel and Jewish education because up until now, according to you and most people in the room, we're not doing a really good job. Are you talking about Israel contributing to the Jewish education of Americans? Being a partner with not paying for it. No, no, I mean that. We're not going to do that. <laughs> but, no, but being a big, okay, but a partnership in terms of American Jews receiving education. Okay. It's a very good question. So first of all, let me say that even in Israel, by the way, we don't have this entirely worked out. I mean, we have really significant Jewish education challenges in Israel. Uh, and I think I mentioned before that what I, you know, what I do when I'm not traipsing around speaking for stand with us, I have a real job. Uh, my real job is actually building Israel's first liberal arts college with a bunch of very talented colleagues because we actually think that Israeli college students need to be educated in a profoundly different way than Israel's been educating its college students now uh, for exactly the same reason. So when I give you my answer, I don't want it to sound like uh, it's coming from the perspective of someone whose country's got it all worked out. We have enormous issues of non-commitment to Zionism among Israel's youth. We have enormous issues of real a lack of worldliness and a lack of intellectual sophistication among Israel's youth. We, by the way, have an unbelievable distancing from young Israelis and their tradition. And I'll just give you one example, which has got nothing to do with our topic tonight, but I just think it's relevant to your question. Uh, my son, before he went into the army, went on one of these one year between high school and army programs called the Pinat Dam Sayyid. It's a, a pre-army, just pure study. You don't get any credit for anything. Anybody just tell me, you think the smart kids and you're much better prepared to talk to you about lying under the army and all a bunch of other issues. At a certain point, um, they had a problem, and it's half religious kids, half non-religious kids, and you know, half men, half women, it's very mixed. And the Talmud teacher had a really interesting challenge because half the kids have been studying Talmud for seven, eight years, and half the kids have never seen a major Talmud. And now he's got to teach them all. So he did something smart. He brought the, um, the Hebrew translation of Talmud, so there was no Aramaic involved, and everybody ever spoke Hebrew, so that levels the playing field. Then he took a relatively easy passage, the very first passage out of the Tractate of Rahot, which talks about from when you can read the Shema, what time of the night, what time of the morning, etc., etc., etc. And he told them to go, you know, in pairs, one with more background, one with less background, which was youth, because it's one religious kid and one secular kid, um, to go figure out what are the questions you would want to ask about this passage. So my son comes home and tells us you know, a week or two later that he hops off under a, not under a tree, I guess, on a rock with um, one of these other kids. And, you know, so he's writing down, okay, what questions do you want to bring back to the group? And the kid says, uh, what's the Shema? So my son says, that doesn't mean that. He means, like, you know, why does Rabbi X say this? Why does Rabbi Y say that? Why does Rabbi Z say that? So the kid says, oh, that's a good question, but what's the Shema? And then Avi said, no, 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 I mean, he doesn't mean that kind of question. He means, like, what's the logic of this? The kid said, what's the Shema? <laughs> and then my son got it. <laughs> this 18-year-old raised in Israel just didn't know what the Shema was. I, you know, I think most American kids have gone to fourth grade and still know what the Shema is. So when you can have a kid who is so interested and is really from an elite part of Israel society have to say, rather really kid, what's the Shema? Um, that's pretty sobering, and we have a tremendous amount of work to do on our end as well. Look, I think that this is a much longer conversation, but what I can say is this. I think that there are things about, there are things about um, each society that the other can learn a tremendous amount from the other. So I'll give you a couple of very quick examples, and then we'll continue the conversation some other time. What can Israel learn from America, um, other than how to stand in line? I think that um, Israel has a lot to learn. For example, just to give you a couple, first of all, but this is serious. The, um, the ability to have serious public discourse in a way that involves as much listening as it does speaking. Is, is a huge accomplishment of the American public square, and it's, it's deeply missing in Israel, and it's something that Israelis could learn from how Americans conduct themselves. The idea of pluralism is a distinctly American idea. It's not always actualized perfectly in the Jewish community, to put it mildly, but it's a distinctly American idea. It's not a European idea, and it's certainly not an Israeli idea. We could learn a lot from that. America, because it's very denominational, which in turn is because Protestantism is very denominational, and America's copy, American Judaism is more or less copied the Protestant model, America is highly creative, liturgically, religiously, and so on and so forth. Israel is not. Uh, it has some creativity, it has some very interesting things going on, but by and large, the vast majority of Israeli synagogues do it exactly as it was done 100 years ago. But Israelis are not exactly where they were 100 years ago, and I'm not saying that everything has to be turned on its head, but the idea of all sorts of liturgical creativity and so forth is an idea that is much more comfortable in America 
than it is in Israel. Israelis can also learn, by the way, what it means to be a voluntary community. Israelis would be astounded to see that there are people who call themselves Reformed Jews for whom the synagogue is a major presence in their lives. Israelis think either you're a synagogue-based Orthodox Jew or you're not really very much of anything. And to see other models of Jews who are deeply passionate, who are deeply committed, who care, and etc., etc., these are all things that Israel can learn from America and much, much more. What could America learn from Israel? Well, America could learn from Israel, first of all, what it means to have a pride in particularism, which goes back to the point that I was talking about before. Israelis left, right, middle, you know, all different sorts really do take, by and large, there's exceptions, but by and large, take a great pride in particularism. I think Americans could see the degree to which the mere miracle of the Hebrew language is part of the gas that fuels the engine called Israeli society and the Jewish cultural rebirth, and it would make Americans think twice about the devastatingly stupid decision that was made, which was basically not to make Hebrew part of the curriculum in any serious way of American Jewish life. The fact that American Jews basically don't speak Hebrew, for all intents and purposes, but do learn Spanish and do learn French and take AP tests and pass with a reasonable degree of fluency is a way of saying that basically American Jews made a decision not to give their kids the ability to participate in the nuances of Israeli life not to be able to understand Israeli music, not to be able to understand Israeli movies, not to be able to understand Israeli art, never to be able to open up an original Israeli newspaper. And part of the disengagement between American Jews and Israel is a conscious decision that American Jews made not to work very hard on language. It was a stupid mistake, and it can be stopped. It can be turned around, not for the ones who've already studied, but for the next generation, so thankfully are coming up with life. The last thing I'll give you an example is this. My children at my age when I, my children at their ages now are infinitely more sophisticated and better human beings than I was at their age. And I'll tell you exactly why. Because when I was 22 or 25, the ages of my son and daughter, I'm not a kid, I'm a younger one also, but when I was 22 and 25, I had gone to college, I had gone to rabbinical school, I had started a PhD. It had never occurred to me to do anything in the world that wasn't for me. I tutored a black kid in New York one afternoon a week during my sophomore year in math. His name was Anthony, I still remember. And we spent most of the time trying to explain to him why he shouldn't jump the turnstile of the subway. But okay, I tutored him one hour a week and was appalled that the Nobel Committee overlooked me when it came time. <laughs> <laughs> but hello, I tutored Anthony, you know, I'm here. I never did anything for anybody other than me. And nobody ever asked me to. My children, by virtue of having served in the army, and my daughter, instead of serving two years, served three. My son, instead of serving three, has signed on for seven. My son-in-law, instead of serving three, just finished seven. These are kids who really care, who don't love being in the army. But they do it because they think their country has given them extraordinary gifts and blessings. And they ought to pay some of it back. I think, you're not going to like this, but that's okay, I'm leaving. I think that this would be an unbelievably improved country. If every American kid, Jewish, Christian, Muslim, Baha'i, you name it, was told, this is the best country on the planet. This country, whether you are rich or poor, black or white, Democrat or Republican, gives you blessings that you can't even begin to imagine. It is not a God-given right to go to college at 18 or 19. You will first spend a year, or a year and a half, or two years, and you're going to pay your country back. You're going to pay roads. Forces. I don't care what you do, it doesn't all have to be the army, although America needs more soldiers actually too. Uh, but I think really that what America could learn from Israel in addition to everything else is the kind of unbelievable kids you can produce when you teach your kids that it's not all about them. I was raised by fantastic parents, but nonetheless, I was raised to believe that at that stage of my life it was all about me. My kids have been told very directly, it is so not all about me. And I think they are much better people. So I think the synergy in education is going to come fundamentally not from us fighting curriculum and using the curriculum, and not from birthright in this direction and something else in that direction, even though that's a really good idea, but fundamentally from both societies recognizing with a good, healthy dose of kind of uh, humility about themselves that they have a tremendous amount to learn from each other and about each other. I don't think either side is very good about that right now. And I think that once we get through the very tough time that we're up against right now, 
that could be and should be one of the major agendas of American Jewish leadership. I'm very grateful to you for your attention and wish us all a successful weekend. Wow. Thank you for